Thank you. Good. Steven Weinberg, a visionary and audacious light who forever changed our understanding of the universe, died on July 23rd, 2021 in Austin, Texas, at the age of 88. This talk is based on the obituary that I wrote for him in the October issue of Physics Today, as well as, as, well as other online remembrances. Uh, we heard already two excellent talks yesterday by Paul Shapiro and Fernando Quevedo. And I hope that this presentation adds another dimension from the standpoint of an experimental physicist, colleague at UT Austin and friend. Normally, I try to fill up my time in talks, but it is a Saturday morning, so I will keep it short and bittersweet. Um, next slide, please. No, you jumped ahead. Yes, that you can call me Steve. Okay, that's right. As great a scientist as he was, uh, Steven Weinberg preferred simply to be called Steve, which is how I refer to him throughout my talk. This is illustrated in a story conveyed to me by one of his former PhD students, Jerry Gilbert, about one of the postdocs in the theory group who brought his five-year-old son to work one day, and the child was running around the hallways, as, as five-year-olds do. At some point, Steve arrived and was walking to his office with his old a beat up leather briefcase packed with papers. The kid pointed at him and shouted, Weinberg. Instead of ignoring the boy, Steve walked up to him with a big smile on his face, looked down and told him, you can call me Steve. As graduate students, we got used to calling him Steve. And I learned from that in my own academic career. Always insisting that students call me by my first name, this breaks the ice and helps with a free scientific exchange. Steve taught me that. Next slide, please. So having dispensed with formalities, I can now continue. Steve was born in, on May 3rd, 1933 in Bronx, New York. He was an only child and grew up in an apartment building a few blocks from Yankee Stadium. For those of you who know a little about, about baseball, I grew up in New York going frequently with my grandfather to Yankee Stadium. I never asked Steve if he was a baseball fan, but he must have heard the crowds roar during home games. Steve was proud of his modest upbringings in the Bronx and would tease me occasionally that although I'm a fellow New Yorker, I was from Manhattan where people put on more airs. He had a great sense of humor. Next slide, please. Steve graduated from high school at age 17, class of 1950, from the famed Bronx High School of Science, which was founded um, in 1938. The photo that is shown is of the original building. It's the only photo I could find. Uh, recent pictures of the same, of school, that, which still exists, by the way, uh, show a modern building with a lot of glass. My own preference is for the old building. Next slide, please. So here, here's a photo from the high school yearbook um, of 1950, the class of 1950. So I think it was even mentioned before in several other talks, and everyone knows that, um, that one of Steve's classmates was Sheldon Glashow, who went on to share with him a Nobel Prize in physics. But there were others who also went on to have distinguished careers in physics, two of them are Miriam Sarachik, a famous low temperature experimental physicist at the City College of New York. Uh, and uh, another is Danny Greenberger, a distinguished professor of physics and expert on quantum entanglement from the same institution. Both, both are great friends. Um, to, quote, to quote Miriam, uh, I do remember that he was that redheaded guy who, as all of us recognize, was much, much smarter than the rest of us. Next slide, please. Very sadly, uh, Miriam passed away a few weeks ago shortly after we talked about Steve. Next slide, please. Um, I think you skipped one. Uh, go back one slide, there we go. Uh, 
no, go go ahead one. There we go. That's the yearbook. Um, Steve then attended Cornell University where he graduated in 1954, shown in their yearbook. Uh, if you look closely at the pictures, it may be hard for you to see, but if you look at the bottom left corner, you can see uh, it, 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 his face, um, Steven Weinberg. Um, and uh, my wife, Alicia, did this research actually and found the yearbooks and other early photos of some memorable people. I have to say that this was some class of 1954, which included Steven Weinberg, Louise Wasserman, Ruth Bader, and Marty Ginsburg. Next slide, please. Uh, you could not read the entry in the yearbook, so I pasted it here. Uh, and I, I wanted to point out that how many scholarships Steve received during his education at Cornell, especially to a group of students. I, I think it's important that, that these scholarships actually enabled him to complete his studies. Steve and Louise married after their graduation in 1954 and remained married for the rest of his life. Uh, next slide, please. Steve got his PhD in nuclear physics at Princeton with Sam Triman in 1957. He then held faculty appointments at Columbia, Berkeley, MIT, and Harvard, where he became uh, the Higgins Professor of Physics. And then, well, he did a lot of work before that, but I'm going to focus in on one thing because, in a way, this is the, the key result, um, perhaps, of his whole career a model of leptons. Steve's remarkable 1967 paper, A Model of Leptons, uh, unified electromagnetism and the weak nuclear interaction into one framework, his electroweak theory. In three pages, actually two and a half pages, he used gauge theory to predict W and Z bosons as mediators of the weak interaction, their masses, the existence of neutral currents, and a Higgs boson, all subsequently confirmed by experiment. Next slide, please. For his work, Steve was awarded the 1979 Nobel Prize in Physics, shared with Abdul Salam and Sheldon Glashow. Electroweak theory is the cornerstone of today's standard model of elementary particle physics, which unifies all the forces of nature save gravity. It is the work of many minds and Steve's consistent leadership. He had many other seminal contributions, which I don't have time to discuss in detail, uh, most notably effective field theory, a calculable low energy approximation of the underlying fundamental theory. In a 2009 review article, Steve argued that the standard model is the leading term in an effective field theory. Uh, this is an assertion that is still not proven by experiment. Next slide, please. Well, you can guess what this picture is. And indeed, in 1982, Steve moved to UT Austin, where he founded the theory group and remained on the faculty for the rest of his life. Actually, uh, Louise first moved here to Austin in 1980 as a faculty member of the UT Law School, um, and Steve followed her to Austin. They loved Texas, and he spent his academic career here um, almost 40 years, more than any other place in his career. However, there was one thing he did not like, football. Steve made that very clear, even in a commencement speech that he gave about 20 years ago and was never invited back for a repeat. One time we were both at a dinner for boosters and were seated at the same table with a major donor, uh, a big fan of the Longhorns. That dinner did not go well, but somehow we managed to get through that event without a major incident. <laughs> Steve was appointed as the Josie Regional Chair in Science which also provided an endowment to support his research. Actually, the full name of the chair is, the first name is Jack, uh, middle initial S is in Sam, Josie chair. But Steve preferred to use only the last name of the donor, which you can understand if you say it rapidly out loud. 
Next slide, please. So Steve understood and appreciated the importance of experiments more than any other theorist that I know. And he commented that there was no theory without experiment. Certainly this was true of his 1967 paper, which without experimental verification would have just remained another theory paper with, with no impact. But it was the experiments that actually made it real. Uh, the field of elementary particle physics went through a golden period during the 1970s and early 80s with the experimental verification of most of the details of the standard model as predicted in Steve's 1967 paper. In 1982, after the discovery of the W and the Z bosons, there was a long period of fruitless searches for physics beyond the standard model. And, and I think it's fair to say that we still have not observed physics beyond the standard model. If you, if you put aside neutrino mass, which actually is just an, a slight extension of the standard model, not really new physics. Uh, these, these, the new physics would include supersymmetry and grand unified theories, which predicted new particles as well as proton decay, uh, but still not observed to this day. Steve believed that further progress in particle physics required a national commitment to build a superconducting supercollider in Waxahachie, Texas. In 1987 and 1993, he testified before Congress stressing the need for the new accelerator, but Congress opted instead to fund the International Space Station. Although accelerator physics continues to make um, great discoveries, most notably of the Higgs boson at CERN, these were not the breakthroughs that Steve had hoped for, or at least not, um, not extensions of the standard model. He was also not a big proponent of string theory, which has diverged from possible experimental tests. As far as Steve was concerned, theory must have predictive power and be constantly tested by experiment. This is what he found uh, in cosmology, which became the center of his attention in later years. In fact, we are now in a golden period of non-accelerator-based cosmology and particle physics. Steve proposed axions as dark matter candidates, and his work on weakly interacting particles set the stage for weakly interacting dark matter candidates, still not confirmed experimentally. Steve was eagerly awaiting experimental confirmation of dark matter. Alas, not to arrive in his lifetime. I came to UT as a graduate student specifically to work with Steve. So in a very real way, that's why I came to Texas. He asked me to focus on the calculation of proton decay uh, predicted in a particular grand unified theory. I love this work known as phenomenology, but in the mid eighties, it fell out of favor relative to the hot topic of string theory. When I told Steve that I decided instead to become an experimentalist, he was very kind about it and in later years would always tell me that I saw the light. This was perhaps Steve's gentle way of telling me that, that I would have made a lousy theorist. <laughs> he remained as my co-advisor and then a colleague and friend uh, for many years. Perhaps through his interactions with me and other experimentalists, Steve grew more interested in tabletop tests of fundamental physics. In a paper in Annals of Physics from 1989 entitled testing quantum mechanics, Steve proposed nonlinear corrections into quantum mechanics. He proposed possible experimental tests of his theory using precision atomic physics measurements. This challenge was taken up by the group of David Wineland at NIST in Boulder, where I was a postdoc at the time, though not involved in that work. Uh, as an aside, David Wineland went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2012 for, for other work. I asked David about his interactions with Steve, and he said, I had the pleasure of interacting with him in 1989 when we were able to test his theory for nonlinear terms in quantum mechanics. I was at first very intimidated because of his stature and obvious genius, but he was very easy to interact with, and it was a nice experience for me. Steve explained the Ramsey method of separated oscillatory fields or as he called it, the Ramsey trick, 
to an audience of atomic physicists at a Gordon conference, which caused some, some chuckling in the audience. Uh, this trick, by the way, earned Norman Ramsey a Nobel Prize in physics in 1989. So it's some trick. Uh, the basis for actually all atomic clocks these days. Unfortunately, the experiments in the Weiland group did not find any deviations from standard quantum mechanics, though the size of the effect was not predicted by Steve. As usual in experimental physics, this does not rule out nonlinear quantum mechanics, just sets limits on the size of the effects. And uh, Steve did not stop thinking about this. Uh, and just before the pandemic, uh, spoke to me about a recent idea that he had to test the linear superposition principle of quantum mechanics, uh, doing a particular type of atomic spectroscopy. And I'm hoping that these ideas will eventually be tested in future experiments. And perhaps we will see deviations from standard quantum mechanics. When Steve was writing his textbook on quantum mechanics some years ago, he asked me to explain to him some questions about quantum entanglement and tests of non-locality as expressed in the violation of Bell's inequalities. I dug into the literature and was able to answer his questions on details of the experiments on two photon decay of calcium atoms. He wanted to understand exactly how the experiments were performed and what were the experimental loopholes. This was characteristic of Steve, very, very deep, and really would dive into every topic to understand it completely. Steve was very excited by the observation of gravitational waves by the LIGO collaboration. Oh, this is, of course, is not a tabletop experiment by any means, but is basically an optical physics setup of a Michelson interferometer on a large scale. Before the pandemic, we hosted a visit and colloquium by Rayner, uh, known as Ray Weiss from MIT, who shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for this work. It was fascinating to listen to Steve and Ray Weiss discuss this at lunch. I also remember the drive from UT to the restaurant as Steve drove us there, and his car seemed like a random Brownian particle meandering through Austin neighborhoods while he talked. Steve's car bore evidence of minor encounters with other objects, nothing too <laughs> just enough to be nervous with him at the wheel. When we got to the restaurant, there was no parking. So Steve parked at a nearby dry cleaners. The owner rushed out to tell us to move, but Steve knew him and the owner welcomed him with open arms. Again, this was typical of Steve and how he related to people at all levels. Uh, next slide, please. One thing that always impressed me about Steve uh, was how hard he worked on his calculations and his teaching. In these days of large collaborations, even among theorists, Steve almost always published as sole author. The breadth of his interests continues to astonish me. Uh, for example, a former graduate student, Jerry Gilbert, recently brought to my attention a paper by Steve from 1962 that he wrote as sole author at age 29. To quote Jerry, by coincidence, I have been reading this afternoon the paper, The Iconal Method in Magnetohydrodynamics, for pure physics enjoyment, not because it is related to any research I am doing at the moment, written in 1961 by guess who? Yes, it is a very early non-particle physics paper by Steve. It is a masterpiece of clarity and applied mathematics techniques, and it made, at the time, new contributions to the field of MHD. Most people, even in physics, don't know that he worked in such an area. Steve's practice was to write a book based on his notes for each of his classes. The most recent one is Foundations of Modern Physics. I plan to teach this class next year using his textbook, and I'm actually looking forward to it. Steve was proud of the fact that he wrote everything himself in LaTeX and did not rely on an assistant to do the mundane work of typing and editing. Steve enjoyed teaching and took it very seriously. He rarely missed class, and at age 82, even volunteered to teach for a colleague, Raphael Flauger, who had a death in the family. I recall one time when Steve was having back pain, yet he, he just propped himself up by the blackboard and taught as usual. 
Steve was an extremely kind and generous person, as illustrated in the following story conveyed to me by my former student, David Medin. When I came to Austin, I wrote to Steven Weinberg asking if I could speak with him about research opportunities. He replied saying that he was not going to the office regularly, but that he would meet with me if I let him know beforehand. I was amazed. I couldn't believe the Steven Weinberg would come just to meet me at his office. That was not an isolated event. Steve truly cared about, cared about students as I witnessed on many occasions and as several wrote in online tributes to him. Next slide, please. The last time I talked with Steve was this past April. We discussed the history of quantum entanglement and the possibility of resuming our lunch meetings after the pandemic. Steve liked to go to the East Side Cafe near campus, now closed, unfortunately, as shown in this photo, and would usually order the blue plate special with meatloaf. Steve often insisted on treating me, but when we split the bill, he made sure we left the same tip. So as he put it, they would not think that either of us was a cheapskate. Of course, uh, I guess if we had both left five, a 5% 5 tip, they would have thought we both were cheapskates, but that, I guess, never happened. <laughs> I was looking forward to telling Steve about my group's recent work on quantum-limited acoustic detection, testing the limits of Albert Einstein's 1907 prediction on Brownian motion and its relevance to the search for dark matter events in bubble chambers. Steve would have liked, would have liked it. Combination of two of his passions, cosmology, and history of science. Alas, Steve was gone by July 23rd, a reality that is hard to accept. He will be remembered as one of the greatest physicists of all time. You can read more remembrances. Uh, next slide, please. You can read more remembrances of Steve in physics today. The online version has informal accounts by former students, and colleagues and is available to all. Uh, the online remembrances are by Helen Quinn, John Preskill, Raphael Flauger, Gerald Gilbert, Robert McNeese, Svi Piran, Remo Ruffini, and me. The official Physics Today obituary that I wrote is available to subscribers, but feel free to contact me by email. Um, my email is raisin at physics.utexas.edu, and I will be happy to send you a PDF copy but only if you call me Mark. <laughs> Last slide, please. This is how I like to remember Steve, a picture taken by his wife, Louise, at a conference on Sea Island, Georgia. I miss him and his many hats. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, we have about five minutes before uh, the parallel session starts, so I think we can ask, um, if we have a quick question, we can ask that. And then, um, like I said before, uh, we're starting the parallel sessions at 10, 10 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. as in the schedule, so there'll be a little bit of time. Uh, any quick questions for uh, Mark? <laughs> yes, thank you for calling me Mark. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yeah, let me repeat the question in case you couldn't hear. Um, what advice do you think uh, Steve would have for people getting into the field today? Um, I actually remember him talking about that at some point and, and saying that, that when he, he remembers that when he was a student, people said that everything was already discovered and there was nothing new to find out. And, and that one should just ignore that, that there is always something new there. Uh, and so do not be afraid, but, but be thorough and dive into a topic and follow your passions. That's what I think he would say. And that's what I would say too. All right, thank you. I think this was an excellent tribute to uh, Steven Weinberg.
Um, and thank you very much for giving it. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, 